Last week in 3 John, we talked about Gaius. And we talked about what a great man he was. But within this same congregation, uh, there was another man by the name of Diotrephes, and he was the opposite of all that was said of Gaius. And I suppose that this is the case in so many congregations that there are those in congregations who are like Gaius, and there are those in congregations sometimes who are like Diotrephes. And it is a shame when that is the case, because everyone ought to be like Gaius, and no one ought to be like Diotrephes. And it is true that sometimes Gaiuses are placed in situations to where uh, Diotrephes seems to undo the good that they do. And you wonder what they could have accomplished. You wonder what could have been done had they not uh, had to spend their time in putting out fires and dealing with problems. But that's so often the case. But imagine what this congregation would have been if Gaius had not been there. The Atrophies would have ruled the day. Uh, there would have been no good example to look to. Uh, there would have been no one to offset uh, his attitude and his spirit and his actions. And so sometimes we, we don't focus on things as we ought to, and we tend to focus on the negative and, and overlook the positive. I know as a preacher I do that from time to time, and perhaps elders do that as well. Uh, we deal with problems, and sometimes we focus on the problems, and we forget about the good people uh, who are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and who are faithful to the Lord, and who are striving to serve God. And that would have been easy to do in this setting, to focus on Diotrephes and forget all about Gaius. But John had not done that. In fact, he starts out talking about Gaius. And he'll talk about another man as well, Demetrius, in verse 12, and the good that he's doing. And so John wasn't blinded to that. We don't need to be blinded to that. But we do need to realize that there are people like Diotrephes, and we have to deal with those individuals. And John promises that he's going to deal with Diotrephes when he comes. He's not going to do it in the letter, although he'll mention it. He, he gives, as we've talked about, this warning shot. Uh, for Diotrephes to know I'm coming, I'm going to deal with you, and this is what I know about you, and you've got opportunity to change and turn before I get there, but if you don't, then when I get there, I'll deal with you. The Apostle Paul would do the same thing with the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, as well as 2 Corinthians, he's telling them I'm coming, and I can bring a rod with me if I need to. I can discipline you when I get there, and I will do that if I have to, but you have time and opportunity to change and turn from that. And we hope that you'll make uh, that decision. And had the Diotrephes changed, had the Corinthians changed, and the Corinthians, of course, did, at least in some degree, they changed, then Paul was able to come with a different spirit, and John would come with a different spirit. We need to realize sometimes that w we have a goal in getting people to change, and when those people change, then we have to change too. Our attitude toward them has to change. Our actions toward them have to change because they've, they've repented. And once they've repented, then uh, we, we have to forgive. We have that responsibility to do that. And if we do not do that, then we are the ones that stand in need of discipline uh, rather than them. As we take a look at the Diotrephes here, we want to read verses 9 and 10 and then talk about what's said in these two verses. He says, I wrote into the church... But Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Now, as we look at this, these two verses, we want to see three things. First of all, we want to see what Diotrephes desired. What Diotrephes desired, and that was the preeminence. Then we want to see what Diotrephes declared, and that is that Diotrephes declared malicious words about John. And then finally, we want to see what Diotrephes dared. And Diotrephes dared to cast some out of the church. Now, as we take a look at these three things, I think you'll get a good understanding of who Diotrephes was. Let's start out by talking about what Diotrephes desire, desired, what he wanted. Notice that John says very quickly that Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them. Diotrephes wanted to be first. That's what uh, the phrase, loveth the preeminence, means. It means to desire to be first. 
Diotrephes wanted to be first. He wanted to be number one. He wanted to be the head. He wanted to be the president. He wanted to be in charge of everything. That's what he desired. Now, you know as well as I do that that desire may be a worldly desire, but it should not be a spiritual desire. It might be a worldly mindset, and we might see people like that in the world. We might even, in, to some degree, want to be that in the world. But in spiritual circles, the church only has one head, and we are not that head. And we never will be. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and we have to be willing to be underneath Him and be underneath others uh, as we serve Him. Now, go to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, and you'll see that Jesus was dealing with this spirit among His disciples. Among His disciples, there was this desire to be first, this desire to be in charge, this desire to have other people under you and doing your bidding or your will. It says in verse 20, Then came to Him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping Him, and desiring a certain thing of him. Now, we ought to begin in verse 20 that by pointing out that the mother of Zebedee's children was a godly and good woman as far as we know. In fact, we are highly impressed with James and John. We're highly impressed with Zebedee. We're highly impressed with this family and who they are and what they are like. These are two of the men that Jesus selected to be His apostles. They were men who forsook their nets and followed Jesus. These, these are good men. These are men who stand out in their day and their age. This is a woman who has tried to raise her sons to know God and to serve God. So there's much praise that can be said about her and about them. She comes with them worshiping Him. She's a believer. She is worshiping Christ. She adores Him. So much good that can be said about her. But notice in verse 20 that she is desiring a certain thing of Him. And we know what that is. But look at the context. And He said unto her, What wilt thou? He knew she wanted something. Perhaps she asked for it. Or perhaps he could just tell by the way she was going about what she was doing that she had something to say. She had something to ask. And so he says, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these, my two sons, may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. Just a little request, right? Just a little request that when you come into your kingdom, and she has an earthly view of the kingdom, I've got two sons. You've got a right hand and a left hand. Put one on your right hand, put one on your left hand. Here's a mother who loves her sons. Here's a mother who believes that her sons have great potential. She believes that they could be an asset to the Lord. She believes that she's raised them in such a way that they will be men who are dependable. They will be men who are faithful. They will be men who can help Jesus. And so she says, you put one on your right hand, you put one on your left. And she doesn't tell him which one to put on the right and which one to put on the left. But I suppose it's the oldest on the right and the youngest on the left, but both of them have a position of importance. That's what her request is. Verse 22, But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, we are able. You see clearly here that James and John are there with her. They, they, she doesn't spring this request on Jesus and James and God, John go, Oh, Mom, can't believe you just asked him for that. Or, Mom, you know, we don't want that. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not... No, they were in on this too. In fact, Mark would tell us that they're the ones that make the request. They're a part of this. They're not as they ought to be either. But Jesus explains that you're asking for something, but you don't really know what all that involves. You don't know what that entails. You don't understand that, that with the honor of serving in a high capacity, in a high way, come other problems. 
jobs, other things. I've known men who wanted to be an elder until they became an elder. And then suddenly it what didn't seem so good anymore. It wasn't the position that they imagined. There are a lot longer hours than they anticipated. There's a lot more problems to deal with than they ever thought that there would be. It wasn't what they imagined. I've known people who became preachers, and preaching wasn't what they imagined. It wasn't what they thought it was going to be. It wasn't as easy. It wasn't just getting up and presenting lessons on Sunday. They Maybe they liked that, but there was a lot more to it than that. They didn't realize that they were on call 24-7. They didn't realize that there are times when you make plans and those plans have to change because there are other things that need to be done. They, they didn't realize that. They didn't realize that, yes, there'll be people that'll come out in the back and shake your hand and tell you how wonderful and how great you are. And, but then there'll be other people who'll find issue with what you taught or what you said or how you said it or what you did or what you didn't do. Never imagined that. The disciples didn't understand. She did not understand what she was asking for. But notice they say unto him, we are able. Lord, we're able to do this. Lord, we can handle this. Now, could they handle it? You know the rest of the story, right? When they came to arrest Jesus, James and John, they stood right there with him. No, James and John fled. They ran away. They weren't ready for that. They weren't ready for that. Simon Peter drew a sword. He did better than they did in the sense that he was more ready to stand and to die with the Lord. Thomas was more ready, it seems. Thomas was the one that declared, as they were going back to Jerusalem near the end, let us also go with him that we may die with him. Thomas was fully prepared to do that. James and John weren't ready for this. Verse 23, And he saith unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I have mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Jesus was in subjection to his Father. He said, It is mine to give. It's his to give. He'll give it to whoever he wants to give it to. I won't take his position. I won't take his authority. I'm under him. You're under me. You'll have to take what place God has for you. They're going to be baptized with the same baptism that Jesus is baptized with. And this baptism is the baptism of suffering. Jesus is going to be immersed in suffering. He's very close to that uh, even at this point as we near the end of Matthew's gospel. He's going to be immersed in suffering. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be mocked and ridiculed. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be immersed in suffering, and they're going to be called up in that as well. And it will proceed from there. Verse 24, And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Now, here are the others. Now, why, why are they so upset? Well, they're so upset because what do they want? They want the same thing. They want the same positions. But James and John and their mom beat them to making the request. What if the Lord gives this request? Have you ever been around and somebody asked for something and you thought, I wish I'd thought about that. I wish I'd asked for that. I'd like to have that too. But they did it. They beat you to it. Here's James and John. They're upset because they want these positions well. Now notice what Jesus says in verse 25. But Jesus called them and said unto them, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Now Jesus says you're acting like Gentiles. Now Jesus uses that in the sense of you're acting like unbelievers. You're acting like people in the world. This is what people in the world do. People in the world argue about status. People in the world argue about position. People in the world climb over one another and Claw one another and fight for, for a position. You're acting like Gentiles, Jesus says. You're acting like unbelievers. Now, for those who were Jews, this would have been a shocking statement that Jesus made. What do you mean I'm acting like? It would have been something that would have caught their attention. 
He says in verse 26, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus said, this is the way it is in the world, but it's not the way it is in my kingdom. The disciples had to learn this isn't the way Jesus' kingdom is arranged. It's not the way it's set up. It's not the way it's going to be in the kingdom. But what is the atrophies trying to do? The atrophies is trying to do the very same thing they're trying to do. Maybe even worse, maybe he's desiring to be even in the position of Christ. He has a worldly mindset, wanting to be first. And he's brought that into the church. It's one thing if he wants to be first in society. It's another thing if he wants to be first in the church. That's a desire that doesn't belong in the kingdom. But we know that sometimes it's in the kingdom. Sometimes there are elders that want to be first. Sometimes there are preachers that want to be first. Deacons that want to be first. Members that want the preeminence. There are people like that in the kingdom from time to time. But it's a spirit that is far into the spirit that Jesus wants to be in the kingdom. Go to Matthew chapter 23. We don't have time to read all of this, or at least comment on all of it. We'll go very quickly. Beginning in verse 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Maybe you've heard the expression, sit in Moses' seat. Well, you know, Moses was a great lawgiver in the Old Testament. He was a prophet. He was a leader of God's people. Moses had a very important place. And there were those that wanted Moses' place. You remember Coradatham and Abiram? How that they said to Moses, Moses, you take too much on yourself. You, you need some help, and we volunteer to be that help. Moses, you, you've got authority, but you know what? We need positions of authority, too. We want to be that right there, too. And they challenged the authority of Moses. They wanted to sit in Moses' seat. Of course, God answered them. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up because of what they did. Well, when you think about uh, that spirit, that's a spirit that is existing among the disciples, and Jesus is correcting it. Notice he said this to the multitude, but he also said it to the disciples. They had to deal with this problem too, and we have to deal with those today who want to sit in Moses' seat, who want to be in positions of authority. It says in verse 3, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and to do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. They themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Just said they want to sit in Moses' seat, but they don't want to do the work that Moses did. Oh no, they're not going to lift their fingers to do the work. Moses worked. He said, they just want the authority that Moses had. They just want to sit in his seat. They don't really want to do what he had to do. You see, Moses' job wasn't an easy job. Moses' job was a taxing and hard thing to do. You read through uh, the Old Testament account of Moses, and you'll see, dealing with the people and their murmuring and their complaining and the problems among them, that was not an easy thing to do. They wanted to sit in Moses' seat. They didn't really want to deal with the problems that Moses had to deal with. It says, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. Do you remember in the Old Testament about Rehoboam? And you remember how that Rehoboam sought out the advice. He sought out the advice of the older men who told him, you know, lower taxes, cut taxes. The people were already burdened. But the younger men said, oh, no, no, you put more taxes on them. You, you grind them into the earth and you, you, you show them who's boss. And Rehoboam listened to the young men. And that's why there was the great problem that there was. There are those that bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. They require things of others that they don't require of themselves. They hold people to a higher standard than they hold themselves to. We need to be careful not to do that. In verse 5, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Here's the atrophies. He loves the chief seats. He wants... The first position. He wants people to see him. Verse 7. And greetings in the marketplace. And to be called of men. Rabbi, Rabbi. 
like for people to know who they are and to call their name. We still have this spirit sometimes today. In verse 8, be, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. We have some of this spirit today, uh, even in the body of Christ. We have preachers who want their names to be called, who want their names to be recognized and known, who desire that. Sometimes we have others in the body of Christ uh, that desire that as well. Sometimes we do it because of the crave, craze for degrees and other things, uh, where we identify someone, there's nothing wrong with getting an education. There's nothing wrong with getting a doctorate or whatever. Uh, but if you're doing those kinds of things so that men will esteem you in a certain way and refer to you in a certain way, uh, then perhaps you're getting that for some reason other than to serve Christ. Maybe you're getting that because of what you want uh, rather than for the good of Christ and His kingdom. And so we have to judge our own motives uh, but we have to be careful um, and not call these distinctions on individuals. And Jesus was dealing with that. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Paul is just writing to Christians here. Take a look at what he says in verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Don't think too highly of yourselves, Paul says. Think soberly. Be realistic about who you are, what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. You know, so often when you go for a job interview and you're preparing for that interview, uh, they're going to ask you, uh, what your strengths are. And you're going to have an opportunity to tell them what you think you're good at. But so often in those interviews, there will also be a question of, well, what, what weakness do you think you have? If you've ever been through a class or ever read a book, it'll always tell you, don't, don't say nothing. Don't, don't act like you don't have any weaknesses. Everybody, know, everybody does. And they know you do. And you show that you really haven't given a great deal of thought if you don't have an answer to give. And so prepare an answer. But in preparing your answer, be careful what you pick. Because there are some things that, um, that employers will live with and that won't turn them off, and there are other things that will. For example, don't say, you know, I just have a hard time getting up in the morning. Probably not going to get that job, if that's what you say. Or, I, you know, I have a real hard time finishing when I start. Probably not going to get that job, if that's the way you phrase it. But you might say something like this. You might say, and, and certainly it ought to be true, but, you know, I tend to be a perfectionist. I, I tend to hold myself to a really, really high standard. Well, in the employer's mind, that sounds good. Here, here's a person who really takes pride in what they do. Here's a person who really wants to do a good job. Now, it may suggest that here's a person that's not satisfied and here's a person that we're going to have to work with a little bit, but, but at least it's moving in the right direction, not moving in the other direction. Well, when we think of what Paul says here, he says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Realize that there are strengths. Realize that there are weaknesses in everyone. That's true no matter who you are. That's true in preachers. It's true in elders. It's true in deacons. It's true of everyone in the body of Christ. None of us are perfect. All of us have growth to make. Now, obviously, those who serve in various capacities are, are, are to have already grown to a point uh, perhaps that others have not reached yet. They're not completely perfect yet. There's room for growth, and we have to understand that. Notice in verse 16, he says, be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Here is the idea of, of don't, don't set your mind on high things. Don't always want the chief seat. Don't always have to be first. That's what Diotrephes had not learned. 
Don't ignore those who are lower than you. Don't, uh, don't act like they don't exist or don't ignore what their needs are, what their concerns are. You be concerned about them. Don't be conceited. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 24. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 24. Take a look at what Paul says here. Not that for we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. Now Paul was an apostle, and yet he says, not for that we have dominion over your faith. Paul says, you've got to make up your mind what you're going to do, and you've got to do it. Paul says, I, I can't do it for you, and I can't make you do it. That's something that we have to learn in preaching and, and being elders and, and deacons as well. You can't make people do right. You don't have that kind of dominion over their faith. You can teach them what's right. You can encourage them to do what's right. You can even, to some degree, discipline them if they don't do what's right. And ultimately, they are responsible for their own faith. You don't have dominion over it. We have to keep that in mind. And Paul understood that. He said, not, that, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but our helpers. Paul said, I'm, I'm just trying to help you. We have to keep that in mind. That's what our role is, is to try to help people. Not be lords over them. Not have dominion over their faith in that sense. But to simply be helpers of their joy. Trying to help them to stand on their own two feet by faith. That's the point that Paul's making right here. Do you remember what the mindset of Jesus was in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 8? Well, Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have the mindset of Christ. And the mindset of Christ was he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He willingly submitted even to the death of the cross, Paul says. That's the mindset we're supposed to have. But it isn't the mindset that Diotrephes had. And if you look at 2 John 9, or 3 John 9, you'll see that Diotrephes was very concerned about John. John was a threat to Diotrephes because John was an apostle. John had authority, and Diotrephes knew it. And notice that John says in verse 9, I wrote into the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence, receiveth us not. He, he, didn't, he didn't want that here. He didn't want that letter to be read. Have you ever known someone who had some power and they were against an eldership because they knew if there was ever an eldership that they wouldn't have the power they had before? And so they could find fault with anyone and everyone who was ever put up for the position or for the office or the work of an elder. They, they would, they'd find fault with that man because they knew just as soon as there's an eldership, I'm not going to have the voice, the say-so, the control that I've always had. And so I'm against it. That's Diotrephes. Diotrephes felt that way about John. He was concerned that he might lose first place. And he was willing to do whatever to keep that place. Consider in the second place what Diotrephes declared. Notice verse 10. He says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, Prating against us or prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, forbiddeth all them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Notice John says literally he's walking up and down talking about us. Using malicious words. In Romans 3 and verse 8, Paul would suggest that some had slanderously reported certain things about him. They were trying to destroy Paul's influence. That's what Diotrephes was trying to do. He was trying to destroy John's influence. He was trying to keep John from having an influence with these brethren. Brethren, I want you to understand that the devil drives wedges. That's what he tries to do. He tries to split, divide, separate people. Here's a good influence. Here's a person who needs to be influenced. The devil will drive a wedge between those two because the devil doesn't want this person and their influence to affect this other person. Sometimes individuals join the devil in driving wedges. They present things in a way that's not true. They put the po worst possible construction on things. They lead people to a conclusion that they know isn't true. 
But they lead them to that conclusion because they want to accomplish something. They want to drive a wedge. They want to separate individuals. And that's what Diotrephes was doing. He was trying to separate John from these brethren, these faithful brethren. He, he would have an easier time controlling the brethren if he could keep John out of it. He wanted the brethren on his side, not on John's side. So he'd drive a wedge to try to separate them from John. First Timothy 5 and verse 13, Paul talks about um, the danger of individuals going up and down with these tales and with this talk. Of course, that still happens today. And, and it's still the same purpose. People realize that they'll lose control if, if certain people have influence. And so they try to destroy the influence of those people so that they can have their way. First Peter chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Peter says, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. Here Peter is simply saying there are people who are going to speak evil of you. Be aware of that. Understand why they're doing that. And you keep doing what's right. But I want you to notice in the final place, and the bell's already rung once, so the final place is what Diotrephes dared. Diotrephes dared to do something that is really unimaginable. Diotrephes dared to cast some out of the church. The word cast literally means to drive some out of the church. Now we know based on Acts 2 and verse 47 that the Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved. It's the Lord that adds people to the church. Think about how presumptuous it is for an individual to drive away those that God has added. Here God's taken some of them from the world and He's put them in the church. And here is someone who is presumptuously, because this individual standing in their way of getting what they want, drive them away. Now, they really, he, Diotrephes really had no power to cast them out of the church. The Lord put them in and Diotrephes couldn't get them out. You remember what Jesus taught about uh, the hands of God and how that God holds us in His hands. And, and no man, Jesus says, can pluck them out of my Father's hand. Diotrephes could not pluck Gaius or Demetrius or any of these other faithful brethren out of God's hands. He couldn't do it, but he, he made life miserable on them. He drove them away. He did everything he could to try to get them to quit, to leave, to be unfaithful. But in reality, he really couldn't do anything. They were in God's hands and he couldn't take them out. But we know people who make it hard on individuals to serve the Lord, and who make it hard on individuals to be faithful. And by their actions, they run people off. And by their words, they run people off. That's so far in from the Spirit of Christ. But again, it's because the Atrophies wanted to have their preeminence. And because he wanted that, he was willing to sacrifice anyone and everyone else in order to have that. Now, this is not an argument against church discipline. The Bible teaches us to practice church discipline, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But it is an argument against running people off who have not done anything wrong and who are faithful to the Lord. Diotrephes did not want John or did not want others like John coming in, and so he wouldn't let anybody take them in. Now, we've already said about Gaius. Gaius was a fellow helper to the truth. He took people in. Well, what Diotrephes did is he said, I'm not taking them in, and if you take them in, then I'm going to cast you out. I'm going to drive you away because you're helping them. But Gaius just kept right on helping them. You imagine how miserable life must have been on Gaius because Gaius chose to do the right thing. I know life. I know elders that life has been made miserable for them because they chose to do the right thing. And I know preachers and their lives have been made miserable because they chose to do the right thing. And there were some who did their best to run them away, cause them to resign as elders or cause them to leave as preachers or whatever. That's the spirit of Diotrephes. And John says, I'll deal with it when I get there. And when Jesus comes, of course, Jesus will deal with that as well. 
Thank you very much for your attention this morning. Lord willing, we'll pick up our study uh, next time.